Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to today talk about some general concepts about pathogenesis. Remember, we defined this some time ago, the mechanisms by which uh, viruses cause disease. So we're going to look at some general principles today. We could spend an entire course on this topic. We, we don't have that luxury. But what we are going to talk about is important for understanding a lot of what we're going to discuss in the rest of this course. To study pathogenesis, you need an animal host. You can't do it in cell culture. Well, you can do, perhaps you can do parts of it in cell culture, but in the end, you have to infect an animal and watch how disease develops, depending on what aspect you want to look at. You could look at antibody production in an animal, but ultimately you're gonna to have to measure the efficacy of those antibodies in cell culture. So you, there is some aspect of this that happens in plates of cells, but for the most part, we need animals, and there is where some of the problems begin. For the most part, we can't infect people with viruses. There's some exceptions. There are some viruses that cause relatively mild disease, which will not kill you, and we can test those in people. There's actually a, a company in the UK that you can contract, and they have a facility which has rooms where you can infect people. They have nurses and doctors at hand to take samples and so forth. So if you're a company that has an antiviral or something you want to test, you can go there. But you can only use respiratory viruses and perhaps norovirus. Norovirus is one of those other viruses you can infect people with and do clinical trials. And did I mention this before? I don't remember. Because I tell the story a lot and I don't want to repeat myself. Only recently was it possible to grow neuroviruses in cell culture. And so what would be done if you wanted to do some infections of humans, you would take diarrhea from people with neurovirus, filter it, and then feed it to volunteers. Would you like to volunteer for that? <laughs> it's 300 bucks for a weekend. So they often get medical students to do this. <laughs> it just says something about people who want to be doctors, right? <laughs> so they, um, I know I'm, I'm insulting some of you, but I don't mean to. <laughs> they uh, get them on a Friday and they feed them this delicious cocktail. They develop diarrhea and vomiting the next day. It's a 24 hour incubation. And by Monday, they're ready to go back to class. And so that's why it's worth it. And uh, they can take samples over the weekend and, and test various things. So this often happens at many medical schools where you know, the, the clinical studies go on and they have a student population that they can use for that. But for most other viruses, we can't infect people because there's a potential of, of them killing you. Even influenza viruses are, are too lethal. You could only infect vaccinated people at best and that's not gonna tell you everything about the infection. So what we have to use are animals. And none of them are perfect. None of them are exactly as a human, even a non-human primate, even a chimpanzee, which is 99% human, or vice versa. <laughs> Humans are 99% chimp. Not good enough. Some viruses behave completely differently in chimps as they do in humans. So I have this lovely saying, my sly and monkeys exaggerate. When we come to animal models, you never are sure. You have to plan your studies really well to get the information you want. Nevertheless, they're very useful, but they are not predictive. They're not predictive of what happens in people. You have to remember that. You can use them to make observations, and ultimately you'd like to be able to look in people to see if the same things hold, if you can. Mice are commonly used for uh, studying virus infections for obvious reasons. They're relatively small. They're genetically inbred. Uh, you can breed them pretty easily, although if you've ever done animal studies with mice, you know it's not cheap to keep one mouse for a day. The husbandry is pretty expensive. Uh, but nevertheless, we can use them. They're much more convenient than other animals. And there are many things that we can do with mice, uh, which are summarized on this slide. For example, we can put human receptors for viruses into mice. Sometimes that makes them able to be infected. Sometimes we can put the whole viral genome in a mouse, and uh, it won't kill them, and we can use that. Uh, or we can produce individual viral gene products in mice to see the, f the effect of those. And all of these have been done before. And then you can see what happens in the animal in as far as infection and disease go. You can look at the host response, the antibody and cellular response as well. Uh, some other things that have been done is to introduce clonal T cell receptors. When 
you have a virus infection, T cells amp are amplified that recognize specific epitopes, and you can purify one of those, which we say is clonal, and put it in the mouse and see what's happening. You can delete immune mediators. We've talked about some experiments where we take out antibodies or T cells, for example. Or you can overproduce immune mediators. These are just some of the things you could do in uh, a mouse model. So they are genetically manipulable. You can knock out mice, uh, genes in mice. You could add genes in. A lot of things you can't do with uh, other animal models. Uh, we also uh, have two general approaches to studying viruses in these mouse models. Sometimes human viruses will replicate in mice. Not always, but sometimes. Sometimes it's only a receptor you need to put in for a virus, and that will allow replication. Not always, but in some cases, the human viruses will grow without manipulation. Uh, an example is, um, I'll show you an example for a receptor, but, in a, but another example is Zika virus, which will, if you infect a normal wild-type adult mouse, it will multiply, will cause a viremia, and that's the end of it. There's no disease, there's no fever, there's no, the virus is cleared. So that's not a very good model for anything, right? But if you delete the interferon response, you can take out one gene and do that from the mouse, then the infection is lethal. The virus replicates, it gets into the CNS, causes pathology and disease. So sometimes you have to do that. Also, we can use animal viruses that resemble human infection. We can look in nature and see if they're counterparts uh, to animal viruses that uh, can cause similar infections. And uh, if they're close enough, we can do that. Now, I've always wanted to make a mouse model for rhinovirus infection because the, the common cold symptoms are all immune mediated. And it would be nice to be able to study that in a mouse. It was never possible to do. So what we're doing now is going into wild mice and seeing if there are any mouse rhinoviruses that might work. I've got 50 trachea from mice all over New York City sitting in the freezer, and we're going to look in that to find uh, mouse rhinoviruses. So here's an example of some work that we did uh, many years ago in our lab up at the medical center. For one of my early students, Kathy Mendelson, was actually the person who identified the cell receptor for poliovirus. She cloned the human gene encoding that receptor. This is about 1989 or so or maybe 88, 81. Uh, and then a second student of mine, Reed Bowren, a few years later, took the gene encoding the human poliovirus receptor, made a transgenic mouse expressing the poliovirus receptor protein, and that mouse can now be infected with poliovirus. So if you take a wild mouse or a laboratory mouse without the polio receptor gene and you infect it with poliovirus, nothing happens. The virus does not replicate. You can put 10 to the 9th PFU of poliovirus right into the brain of these mice and they walk around fine and they have a normal lifespan. But if you put the poliovirus receptor in, the mice become paralyzed. You can see this animal has hind limb paralysis. So this was actually the first transgenic mouse model for a viral disease and since then several others have been made as well. And we and others have learned a lot from studying disease in these animals. We've learned a lot about vaccines and antivirals, how the virus spreads within the host. And some of that we'll talk about later when we talk about uh, the production of disease. Now, one of the goals of um, studying viral pathogenesis is to understand what we call viral virulence, the capacity of virus to cause disease in a host and we talk about viruses that are virulent, that cause diseases, or viruses uh, that are attenuated. An attenuated virus doesn't cause disease or it causes reduced disease, okay? Remember that term, attenuated viruses, because when we talk about vaccines, it's gonna come up a lot. And attenuation is the process of producing such a virus. You might be beginning to realize that we can quantitate virulence. In fact, we have to in order to study it in our animal models. You couldn't just say infect mice with a virus and say, ah, the mice got sick and these controls didn't. That would be useless, right? Because it's all, it's too subjective. So we can measure virulence in specific ways that can be compared. And some examples include mean time to death. That's a pretty dramatic outcome. Mean time to appearance of symptoms. Actually, not, not the right word, right? Symptoms is wrong. It's signs. Yes, signs. Symptoms are something you can tell 
the doc and or the nurse and <laughs> signs are what you show. So I have to change that. I've been doing that for eight years. How about that? Mean time to appearance of signs. Measurement of fever, weight loss, or pathological lesions. For polio, we, we cut open the brain and make slices and look at them in the microscope and we can see the lesions caused by virus destruction. Uh, for HIV, a very common one is your CD4 cell uh, level in the blood. You take some blood, you measure how many CD4s per microliter and that's an indication of how far you are along in AIDS. But these are just a few, very many, many others depending on the virus and the experiment, just to give you an idea that we can quantify some of the features and that way we can compare different viruses or different antivirals and so forth. So here are some examples of measuring viral virulence. On the left is a very straightforward one. We're looking at the numbers of survivors. This is how many mice are killed uh, by a particular virus. So th these animals have been inoculated with either type one or type two polio virus. They're mice. Uh, they're inoculated with two different serotypes of the virus, and we're looking at different times post-infection. So in this experiment, you have to go to the mouse facility every day and see if the mice are alive. All right? Sometimes you have to go twice a day, depending on how rapidly the virus is acting, and that's because of the regulations, animal husbandry regulations. Uh, make it important not to let an animal suffer any longer than necessary. So in some cases, you go twice a day. You can see the type 1 virus never kills any animals. They survive, whereas the type 2 uh, virus kills them within 11 days. And you could look for the 50% survival rate. You would, so there are five mice here. We would go two and a half over, and then you could get uh, the, the mean time, or the 50% uh, time to, inf to infection, to survival. Or you could look at how much virus is needed to cause that. On the right is a more involved way to measure viral virulence. Here we're looking at... Uh, what we call neurovirulence score. We've inoculated mice with different uh, flaviviruses here, uh, five different flaviviruses. Uh, and then we're looking at different parts of the brain, cerebellum, brain stem, and the spinal cord. And sections are taken, tissue sections are taken of each part of the brain and spinal cord. They're looked at under a microscope and then a pathologist will put a number on the lesions that are caused by infection. And usually it's a scale of zero to four, zero being no lesions and four extensive, with very defined ways of measuring that, of course. And you can see that these viruses differ in their ability to cause lesions. So the relative score is a, is a mixture of, uh, of all the observations by the pathologist in the different sections of the brain. So some of these uh, viruses are quite uh, neurovirulent, and they make lesions in all parts of the brain. Uh, and you can see the dengue put directly into the brain, doesn't do very much anywhere. And some of them uh, have more effects in the spinal cord than in the brain itself. So that's another way we can measure virulence. And in fact, the, the infectious poliovirus vaccines that are used nowadays, the way they are tested to make sure they're attenuated, is they are injected into the brain or spinal cord of a non-human primate, and after three weeks, they're sacrificed, and the, section, the tissues are sectioned, and you come up with a neurovirulence score like this, just to measure the neurovirulence of the virus. Now, virulence, this is very important, this point on this slide. Virulence is a relative property. It is influenced by many, many parameters of the experiment. The dose of virus, obviously, you give more or less virus, that's going to influence virulence, but also things you may not think about. The route of infection, the species that you're using. A virus may wipe out a mouse, but may have no effect in a rabbit or some other animal. The age of the animal make a, may make a huge difference. The gender and the susceptibility of the host, the, susceptibility having to do with whether there are receptors or not. All this means is that you can't compare the virulence of different viruses. It's not right to say that Ebola virus is more virulent than smallpox virus or polio virus because they're different viruses. Now we know that Ebola virus is very virulent because we know that you know, a certain percentage of people who are infected die and you may say, well, why can't we compare the percent 
mortality rate among different viruses? Not really, because there are different populations being infected and different amounts of virus, different transmission routes. It's not fair to do that. And so we cannot compare viruses directly. If you wanted to compare um, virulence, the best you can do is among viruses of the same family or maybe even the same genera. And the assays have to be the same, of course. So here's an experiment that shows you how virulence depends on the route of inoculation. This is an arena virus, an envelope segmented virus uh, with an ambisense viral genome. And this is lymphocytic choreomeningitis virus. This is a virus of rodents. You can find it in the wild. And it, it generally doesn't infect people. But people who buy pets, pet rodents, uh, can be infected. And if you happen to be immunosuppressed, for whatever reason, if you have another immunosuppressive viral infection, if you're receiving immunosuppressive therapy for an organ transplant, there have been some lethal infections caused by people who get infections with LCMV from their pets. Anyway, this, uh, show, this is a very good experimental virus in the laboratory to study the immune response because it infects mice naturally and people have done lots of work with it. Here's an example where we infect mice with 100,000 PFU intraperitoneally. Put a needle in the, right into the peritoneal cavity, very easy to do in a mouse. All the mice survive. 100,000 PFU, but one PFU right into the brain, all the mice die. So if you just in inoculated mice uh, intraperitoneally with, there's an extra O in there. Look at that. <laughs> First time I've seen that. Uh, if you just inoculated IP, you would say, ah, oh, this is virus isn't replicated in mice, it's attenuated, but obviously it depends on the route of inoculation. You have to be really, really careful, otherwise you're going to be fooled. So keep that in mind. You never know when it's going to pop up. Question one, which statement about viral virulence is wrong? It can be influenced by dose, route of infection, species, age, gender, susceptibility of host. It can be quantitated by measurement of fever. Ebola is more virulent than human papillomavirus. It is the capacity of a virus to cause disease. When comparing virulence, the assays must be the same. The answer, of course, is C. You can't say that's wrong. Ebola virus is more virulent than human papillomavirus for reasons that I've stated, and most of you got that. A few of you said it, it's wrong to say it can be quantitated by fever, and that's perfectly fine. Capacity of a virus to cause disease in a host, that's correct. And the assays must be the same for sure. Absolutely, those are all things that I've said. Now in virology, uh, if people who study pathogenesis, one of the major goals is to identify viral and host genes that control virulence. And notice I say viral and host because both contribute if you think that only viral genes are involved, then you would be wrong because the host makes a major contribution as we're gonna see uh, later today. And the way we identify viral virulence genes is to make mutations in the virus and uh, then infect an animal model and see if we can identify mutations that reduce or abolish virulence. And then we say, okay, we have a gene that's involved in virulence and now we can study how it works because that's obviously the goal, not simply to identify the gene, but to understand how it's uh, working. You can also make mutations in hosts now. We have the capacity to do so. CRISPR is a good way to do it. It's a more recent development, but even before CRISPR, there were other ways to delete or reduce gene expression in animals or cells. So here's an example of an experiment where we are identifying viral uh, virulence genes. We have a virus that we're measuring in a mouse model for virulence when inoculated directly into the brain. So we're measuring uh, neurovirulence. Are we measuring neuroinvasiveness in this assay? No, neuroinvasiveness, we would put a virus in the foot pad and then see if it gets into the brain. Neuroinvasiveness is the capacity to invade the brain. So here we have wild type virus that grows very well in cell culture and you inoculate it in mice, it's neurovirulent. And we can measure neurovirulence in a number of ways, paralysis or death if you want, any, any of them. Okay, now we have made a variety of virus mutants and we have one uh, where 
in cell culture, the mutation makes the virus grow poorly. You see there are fewer plaques and they're smaller. And in, in an animal, when inoculated into the brain, uh, this virus doesn't grow well and it's attenuated. It doesn't cause disease. It's not neurovirulent. But that's not an interesting mutant at all because all it does is make the virus grow poorly. And so this is a gene that's needed for replication. What we want are genes that are specifically needed for causing disease that have little to no effect in cell culture, yet in an animal make a big difference. So the last example here, here we have a mutant, and these two viruses have a mutation in, in a specific gene. They have one mutation. The, the one in the middle has one, and the other is in a different gene. So the mutation in the gene specifically required for virulence, as I said, the virus still grows well, as you can tell by plaque assays. Uh, and it doesn't grow well in the brain which you can assess by taking the brain out and grinding it up and doing a plaque assay. And this virus does not cause disease. So it's this gene product is specifically needed for growing in the brain and causing disease. That is an interesting gene to work on because it's somehow specific to the animal. And these are the kinds of genes we want to find. And many people have done this for many viruses uh, in many kinds of hosts. And over all the years of this work, we can put uh, viral virulence genes into a number of different categories. Again, based on what we've seen in many different viruses. Uh, they, they can affect replication, specifically in the animal, again, whatever the target tissue is. They can affect invasiveness. So maybe the virus, you put it in the foot pad, it's neuroinvasive, and you find a gene that blocks the invasion of the virus into the CNS it would be great if it's still replicated well in the foot pad, but couldn't get into the CNS. That would be really nice. Uh, there's some mutations that affect tropism. The ability, the virus may get to the brain, but it no, no longer can replicate in uh, neural cells, for example. Some of these genes encode proteins that modify host defense mechanisms. We've talked about a few of the immune modulators of viruses so far. Now you can imagine that these don't have any effect in cell culture, right? You don't need to evade antibody and T cell responses in cell cultures because there aren't any. And so though, if you take out those antagonism genes, the viruses grow well in cell culture, but as soon as you put them in the animal, the virus can no longer overcome host defenses. So those are virulence genes. There are other genes that allow spread in the host, and some viral genes have intrinsic cell killing effects. So some viruses cause damage by killing cells, right? Lytic viruses, and if you take that away, uh, they can have effects on virulence. Now, not all virulence determinants, so this is what I'm talking about here, uh, we're identifying genes that, when mutated, affect virulence. And so I would say that gene is a virulence determinant. Not all need to encode protein. Here's a very nice example that we have studied many years ago the five prime non-coding region of poliovirus. Remember, polio is a plus strand RNA virus with a RNA genome on the bottom here. The five prime N is non-translated. It's highly structured. It's an internal ribosome entry site, iris. And the three Sabin vaccine strains, these are infectious attenuated vaccines that we still use globally today. They have mutations in the five prime non-coding region that makes them attenuated. It reduces their neurovirulence. Mutations are located in this stem loop called stem loop five, which is expanded on the right. <clears throat> and the three serotypes of the polio vaccine strain have three different kinds of point mutations here, type one, type two, and type three. And these are remarkable in their ability to uh, prevent neurovirulence of this virus. Now these mutations, when Albert Sabin was developing his vaccines in the 1950s. There was no sequencing possible. He had no idea what he was doing. All he did was pass human viruses in different hosts and identify empirically viruses that would not cause paralysis in animals. And eventually those were licensed. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the vaccine lecture. And it wasn't until the 80s when we gained the ability to sequence genomes that people found that um, he had selected for specific changes uh, in this 5' prime non-coding region. Now, there are other examples in other viruses as well. So the a virulence determinant doesn't have to be coding. Here's an experiment that shows you the effect of these 5' prime non-coding mutations on poliovirus virulence. So what we have here is our mouse, our transgenic mouse model, where we infect the animals and we're looking at 
uh, death or replication caused by the virus. So we have two viruses here, two polioviruses, which are exactly the same except at base 472, which is important in the attenuation of the type 3 polio strain, we have a virus with a U or a C. Sabin's vaccines have a U at 472. Uh, you can never get any of these to paralyze mice. You can put 10 to the seventh PFU and, and the mice are fine. They, they don't get paralyzed. But if you uh, infect with viruses with a C, 9,000 PFU are enough to paralyze or kill half of the animals. That's the lethal dose 50%. One base difference between the two viruses in a non-coding region. It's really amazing. And here's a growth curve in mice. Uh, these animals were infected with these two viruses. And at different times after infection, we're looking at virus in PFU per gram of brain. You take out the brain, obviously, and you uh, grind it up, determine the virus titer by plaque assay. And you can see viruses with a C grow very well. And of course, that's why they paralyze and kill. And the viruses with the U are cleared simply uh, after a few weeks. So a single base change in a non-coding region can markedly affect virulence. We have no idea how this works to this day. We've been working on it for 30 years, and nobody's working on it anymore because you can't really work on polio anymore. So uh, this is a mystery that will endure probably forever. Some of the other virulence genes, as I mentioned, are gene products that modify host defenses, and they include uh, immune modulators, proteins that we've talked about. They modulate apoptosis, autophagy, intrinsic proteins like ApoBac. We talked about an HIV protein that antagonizes ApoBac. There are also proteins called virokines and viroceptors, which I mentioned. These are homologs of chemokines and chemokine receptors. Remember, chemokines are elaborated by immune cells and infected cells in order to recruit, to stimulate inflammation, to help recruit the immune system. And viruses can make analogs of those that block the responses. They can make virokines, which look just like the chemokine. They bind the receptor, but they don't initiate a signal. So they block the receptors from the real chemokines. They encode viroceptors, which are soluble chemokine receptors, which bind up all the chemokines that are made and block their activity. And if you delete these genes, they are, those viruses have reduced virulence because they can't antagonize the chemokine response. There are also complement binding proteins that are in antagonizing complement. These are virulence factors. Modifiers of MHC1 and 2, which we talked about on Monday. Also, when you delete those genes, Encoding the modifiers, those reduce virulence. And as I said, they're often not required for uh, growth in cell culture. Of course, there are, there are some exceptions. Some of the intrinsic uh, antagonists, intrinsic responses do occur in many cell cultures. And so deleting those would have an effect there. So here's an example of a viral virulence gene identified in a herpes virus that infects mice. This is a natural herpes virus of mice that many investigators use uh, because it's a mouse virus. It's called gamma herpes virus 68. And uh, these, this is a percent survival experiment where we are infecting mice uh, with three different viruses. Uh, and then we look for lethality and for cellular infiltrate. And in this graph, we're looking at lethality. Uh, we have the wild type virus. You can see with increasing doses, 1 to 10 to 100 to 1,000, the percent survival goes down. So this is a dose response curve for survival. And then we have a virus where we've deleted uh, a gene called M3, which encodes a chemokine receptor, or which we would call a virokine. So again, this is an antagonist of chemokine responses. And you can see that that virus is, uh, is attenuated. Now, you need a lot more virus to kill many of the animals. In, in fact, where you have 100 PFU of the wild type virus uh, will kill 25% of the animals. You can see you need a lot more for the mutant. Or let's go to the 50% point. That's the way to do it. You can see the difference right there. Hardly any mice are dead uh, with, no mice are dead with the, uh, with the mutant virus and about half of them are, are dead with the wild type. And then, because this gene is removed by genetically manipulating the virus, whenever you do that, you never know if you're making changes elsewhere by mistake. These are called off-target effects. So you, know, you may withdraw a piece of DNA from a virus, but inadvertently something else may be happening. So to make sure that's not happening, you put the gene back in 
and then you see if you restore the phenotype. And you see here, uh, that's the red line. We've uh, done, taken the deletion virus and we've put the uh, M3 gene back in. MR stands for M rescue. And you can see uh, that virus has wild type killing kinetics. So that means there aren't any other mutations that we've introduced in the genome. If the curve for M, M3 MR looked like uh, wild type, that would be a problem. That meant uh, probably there was some other gene uh, that were, sorry, that looked like the mutant virus, that would mean something else had happened. That's very important to do. So that's an example of a viral virulence gene. Now in the bacterial world, often when you get bacterial infections, the signs and symptoms are in part caused by toxins that are produced by bacteria. Diphtheria toxin, for example, botulinum toxin, these are all famous toxins that cause uh, very serious effects, and there are others. Viruses in general do not encode toxins in their genomes, but there are a few exceptions, and one of them is shown here. Uh, the rotaviruses, which are agents of gastroenteritis, uh, that you have most certainly encountered in your lifetimes, they tend to infect uh, kids in the first 10 years of life and make their parents' lives miserable. Uh, they cause uh, gastroenteritis, and they encode a viral enterotoxin, a protein called NSP4, which has been shown if you make this protein and feed it to an animal model, the animal in this case is, the, is, a, is a calf, uh, it gives them diarrhea, very much like the virus does. And this protein, we think, uh, does so in several ways. It inhibits a, so a sodium glucose uh, luminal co-transporter, and so this is a a, a transport molecule that's important for maintaining the correct balance of sodium in the cells. And when that's inhibited, fluid tends to leave the cells and that causes diarrhea. And also the, trans the NSP4 seems to get in cells and uh, activate a signaling pathway resulting in high calcium levels inside of the cells. And then um, that leads to release of uh, fluid as well. So that's an example of a viral enterotoxin. Here's another cool uh, virulence factor. This happens to be a cellular virulence factor. We'll, we'll talk about more of these later, but this is an interesting one. Uh, I'm sure all of you know about microRNAs. These are small RNAs produced by cells that regulate gene expression. Well, there's one called uh, microRNA-122, which is a liver-specific microRNA. So all of you have MIR-122 because you need it for cholesterol balance in your liver. It turns out is required for the replication of hepatitis C virus. So this is a hepatotropic virus. It causes a lot of infections globally, which in many cases lead to liver cancer. So this is why we're very worried about this virus. We'll have more to say about it later. Isn't it amazing? This virus has evolved to require a liver-specific microRNA for its replication. So the virus doesn't replicate in other tissues, mainly because they don't have MIR-122. And you can show in cell culture, if you introduce MIR-122 into a cell line that the virus doesn't replicate in, the virus will now grow. Anyway, some antivirals are being developed which target MIR-122. You can make uh, small, what are called locked nucleic acids. So if you made an RNA uh, or, or a DNA oligonucleotide, they typically don't have very good stability in the bloodstream, but you can modify them in ways that they're resistant to degradation. And so here's one of them uh, called Miravirsin. This is a, uh, a, an oligonucleotide that's complementary to MIR-122. The idea being, if you, if you block MIR-122, it's not going to be available to uh, potentiate viral replication. The way that MIR-122 works, it base pairs with a sequence uh, in the 5' non-coding region of the viral genome. There's the 5' UTR of hepatitis C virus, and there are a couple of MIR-122 binding sites, and those are needed for potentiation of viral replication. And so having the Miravirsin there blocks the uh, MIR-122 and prevents it from stimulating viral replication. And so these, uh, these antagomeres, this one's called Miravirsin, they've been put in human clinical trials and they work pretty well to uh, inhibit hep C replication. 
Of course, there are many other antivirals out there as well that are really good for blocking hep C. We'll talk about some of those later. Now let's talk about how viruses cause uh, the symptoms of an infection. And the first topic is how viruses directly injure cell. A good fraction of pathogenesis, the signs and symptoms of an infection, the damage to organs and so forth, is for many viruses, but not all, caused by direct effects of viruses on cells. We've seen earlier on how when you infect cells in culture, the cells round up, detach, and become lysed. Well, if you can imagine, if that's your liver being infected and the cells are being lysed, you're gonna have tissue damage and you're gonna have generalized symptoms of various sorts. So that we call those cytolytic viruses, viruses that, uh, viruses that infect cells and kill them. And uh, they cause cytopathic effects, they kill the cells, and they induce a variety of processes like apoptosis, necrosis, pyroptosis, these are just different kinds of programmed cell death. And that's how they make the, the cells die. Some viruses, some viral genomes encode viral porins. Uh, these are proteins that insert into the membrane of the cell, they make holes and the contents come out and that's the way they kill the cell. Uh, many viruses inhibit host protein and RNA synthesis. We've mentioned that uh, very briefly. And that tends to, inhibition of these processes tends to cause uh, a decrease in membrane integrity. So remember, lysosomes in the cell contain nasty enzymes, proteases and RNases and so forth within a vesicle. But if these things get leaky, they leak into the cytoplasm and the cell begins to digest itself. And that contributes to death as well. And maybe you remember uh, syncytium formation by envelope viruses, parainfluenza, HIV and others. The fusing of cells to make giant cells with multiple nuclei, that's gonna kill the cell eventually. The cell's not gonna live like that. So these are some examples of the way uh, viruses kill cells directly. And that, of course, contributes to pathogenesis. If you can make mutations in the genes that are responsible for these properties, you'll have attenuated viruses, uh, as we've discussed. Uh, before we move on to other ways of causing disease, I want to mention a, one study, which has now been shown for other viruses as well, which shows that viruses are not working by themselves in us. And this is a study of poliovirus infection of our transgenic mice done by uh, a group in Texas where they've shown that the microbiome of the mouse is absolutely essential for virus replication. So what they've done here is they have taken uh, transgenic poliovirus receptor mice and they've either treated them with an antibiotic, they feed them an antibiotic cocktail, and that dramatically reduces the number of colony forming units per milligram of feces from these animals, or these are untreated mice. You can see they have lots of bacteria in their feces. And then they infect these two groups of animals uh, with poliovirus on the graph on the right. And you can see the untreated mice are the round circles. Uh, on the, on the y-axis, we have viral replication. And the virus replicates quite well after feeding the virus orally to these mice. You can see 100% uh, of the animals uh, virus is replicating. In the antibiotic treated mice, the squares, there's no virus replication. So simply reducing the microbiome eliminates the ability of poliovirus to replicate. Now, is this because the virus is replicating in bacteria? How can poliovirus replicate in bacteria? It's a eukaryotic virus. A virus that replicates in bacteria would be a bacteriophage, right? Uh, this is because some component of the microbiome must be needed for the virus. And as investigators have shown, things like lipopolysaccharide, uh, components of outer membranes and so forth of the bacteria are what's needed. They stabilize the virus apparently, so it's not inactivated by the pretty harsh gut uh, environment. And this has been shown for other viruses as well that replicate in the gut. And I'll bet it's similar for viruses that replicate at other sites where there are microbiomes. And you know, most of our body has a microbiome. Uh, as well. And this is, makes perfect sense, right? Viruses have evolved in environments, say the gut, full of bacteria. Why not take advantage of something that stabilizes you there? So you can imagine years and years ago, the original poliovirus infected an animal's gut, and some mutant arose that was stabilized by some bacterial content, and that persisted. That multiplied better than the others, and that's why that was selected for. So this is, very, people are very interested in this because obviously everyone's microbiome is different, so that's gonna affect your susceptibility to disease. Right now, everyone's so excited about the genome, 
oh, let's find genes that control disease susceptibility, but no one is thinking about the genome and the microbiome. You have to put the two of them together, as you can see from this experiment. Okay, next question. Which statement about determinants of viral virulence is wrong? Uh, the virulence genes can encode viral proteins. Virulence genes can encode cellular proteins. They are, all, they are the same in all viruses. They can be found in untranslated regions. They may encode immune modulators. Which one's wrong? Of course, the answer is C. They are the same in all viruses. They're not. They're different. If they were the same, we could just find one, and then our work would be done, but it's not. And they can, virulence genes uh, can encode cellular proteins. Um, there are, right, well, the mirror isn't a cellular protein, but there are other examples as well, which uh, I believe I mentioned. By the way, you think the solution to preventing polio is simply to give everyone antibiotics to wipe out their gut microbiome? Why not? You need them. You need them, of course. Yeah, it's very bad if you, if, you if you take away your gut microbiome, say by antibiotic treatment, you go for surgery, it's likely that bad bacteria are going to overgrow like Clostridium difficile. Very bad things happen, so we can't do that, no. All right, now let's talk about immunopathology, what I like to call too much of a good thing, because it turns out that most symptoms of virus infections, most of the pathology of virus infection is not necessarily what the virus is doing, but a combination of that with the host. The clinical symptoms, we know, we know this, I've already told you, the flu-like symptoms, fever, tissue damage, well, not tissue damage, but fever, general malaise, and so forth, that's definitely caused by the immune response, but often tissue damage is also a consequence of the host response. And in fact, for viruses that don't kill cells, non-cytopathic viruses, the disease we see in animals is entirely immunopathological. That means it's caused by the immune system. And so it's the price you pay to have a great immune system to keep you protected. You're gonna have some damage and hopefully you survive the damage. The problem is with viruses like Ebola virus, the immune response is enormous and it overwhelms many people. And I think in part that's because this is a virus that's not well adapted to people. Every time we have an outbreak, it's a brand new spillover from an animal. So uh, that, there are issues there. We'll come back to that when we talk about uh, emergence. Uh, so here are some examples of immunopathology, specific mechanisms uh, for different viruses. So immunopathology can be caused by lymphocytes or antibodies. And lymphocytes can be CD8 positive lymphocytes. So these viruses display uh, CD8, T cell mediated pathology upon infection. We can have CD4 cell mediated infections of the Th1 or the Th2 variety. And antibody can mediate uh, immunopathology as well. We'll go through a couple of these examples to see how they work. And I think you can understand that because we can manipulate mice, we can take away immune populations in very specific ways, that's how we figured out uh, a lot of these pathologies. So here is uh, disease mediated by CD8 positive cytotoxic T lymphocytes, right? Those are CTLs, essentially CD8 cells. We talked last time about how they are elaborated. In this experiment, we put LCMV uh, right into the brain of a mouse. Of a mouse. Within eight days, the mouse is dead of the, a disease called lethal chorio-meningitis. Uh, we do a separate experiment where we infect mice, and then at the same time, we immune suppress them. We use a drug that gives a general suppression of immune responses. The mice get a persistent infection, and they live. These mice are quite happy, you can see. And then we give those animals CD8-positive T cells uh, that have been taken from an immunized mice, so they're specific for the virus. That's called adoptive immunization and they're dead in five days. So without CD8 cells, the mice survive. You put them back in, they kill them because the CD8s are cytotoxic T lymphocytes. They are obviously causing a lot of tissue damage and that leads to lethality. Nice example of immune pathology. Here's another one uh, which I particularly like. So this is uh, LCMV, again, infection of, of mice on the top two panels. On the left is the survival curve percent alive, 
of mice infected with uh, LCMV. And you can see uh, wild type mice, the black lines, you know, they're all dead in 10 days. But if you knock out perforin, the gene encoding perforin, which is an effector of CD8, CTLs, remember perforin is put in the cell by a CD8 and perforin activates apoptosis and kills the cell. If you knock out the gene, green lines, the mice will survive. So CTLs are killing the virus infected animals. Uh, that's lethality. On the right is another way of measuring virulence by looking at liver enzymes. So serum uh, GLDH. So this enzyme shouldn't be in the serum usually. If you have liver, liver damage, if you have damage to liver cells, the enzyme is leaking out into your circulation. And so you can measure this in the serum. You can see wild type mice, perforin plus plus, the liver enzymes go up certain days after infection. Uh, and in perforin knockout, they don't. So the perforin, the CTLs are killing liver cells, the enzyme is being reduced. So we actually used liver enzymes of various sorts to measure human infections that target the liver, various hepatitis viruses. On the bottom is a section from the heart of a mouse. These mice were infected with Coxsackie virus. Coxsackie, some Coxsackie viruses will cause heart infections. In fact, when people need heart transplants, it's because they've had a Coxsackie infection for a number of years and it's destroyed their heart muscle. And we don't know it, that they've had this infection because it's been relatively silent until it's too late and then we have to give them a new heart. And that's why people are working on this virus. On the left is a section of mouse heart. This mouse was infected with Coxsackie virus and it's stained with a stain. This blue stain shows you tissue damage, actually calcification in between the cells. So that's caused by the virus, and that's not good, that's bad. On the right is a perforin knockout mouse infected with a perforin knockout, uh, sorry, a perforin knockout mouse infected with the same Coxsackie virus. And you can see there's very little damage there. Again, perforin is causing the pathology in, in these two different infections. We have lesions associated with CD4 positive T cells. Remember, these are the ones that make cytokines that can either help antibody production or the generation of CD8 CTLs, right, Th1 or Th2. They make a lot of cytokines. They can recruit uh, effector cells, and they often recruit neutrophils and mononuclear cells, and these are damaging. They have mechanisms, specific mechanisms to try and eliminate virus-infected cells, and it damages the tissues. And so the, 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 the uh, release of proteases, reactive radicals, cytokines is, is uh, all causing immunopathology. Again, these are released by the neutrophils, mononuclear cells, and other recruited cells that come in after uh, these CD4 cytokines are produced. And there's a very interesting example of uh, disease caused by CD4 positive T cells in people. This is herpes stromal keratitis, one of the most common causes of blindness in developed countries. And it's almost entirely immunopathological and depends on CD4 Th1 cells. What happens here, you get repeated infections with, these, with herpes viruses of the eye, which normally shouldn't be there in the eye, it should be in your mucosal uh, tissues, but sometimes it gets into the eye. And after repeated infection, uh, the lens becomes opaque uh, and you get reduced vision. You can see the photo here. You can barely see uh, through the cornea. Sorry, it's the cornea that gets opaque, not the lens. Uh, and uh, this is because of an immunopathological reaction. What happens is the virus replicates in the epithelium. This is a, a cross section of the cornea here in the upper left. And the top cells is a layer of epithelial cells. And that's where the virus replicates. Uh, underneath it, this is the, the, the uh, corneum proper. These are stromal cells that make up the bulk of the cornea. The virus doesn't replicate there, but in fact, that's where the damage occurs in the stroma of the cornea. And the damage occurs because the virus replicates in the epithelium. Uh, TH, CD4 Th1 cells come in, they make cytokines that seep into the stroma and they cause damage uh, in the stroma as well. And there are also CD4 cells in the stroma, which you can see uh, on this section on the right, the epithelial layer is much thinner because it's been infected with herpes virus. And all these CD4 cells are in the epithelium and the stroma as well. And they're secreting cytokines and that damages the stroma and causes the opacity and blindness. Another interesting example is uh, West Nile virus. A certain percentage of people who get West Nile virus infections, a mosquito transmitted flavivirus, have neurological disease, the virus gets into their brains. 
And experiments in mice have shown that if you knock out the toll-like receptor 3 gene, so that's TLR3 minus minus mice, means we've knocked out both copies of the gene, they're resistant to uh, neurological infection by West Nile virus. And that's because in wild-type mice, uh, toll-like receptor 3 senses virus infection. As a result, the cells produce cytokines, including tumor necrosis, tumor necrosis factor alpha, which targets the blood-brain barrier, loosens it up, and the virus gets in and causes neurological disease. Now, that's one of the jobs of TNF-alpha, to loosen up the, the, the endothelium so that immune cells can get through and do their thing in the infected tissues, but it also lets the virus in. So it's a double-edged sword. And so here's an experiment uh, in mice where we're looking at, um, in fact, these are brains of mice, obviously, after West Nile virus infection. And these are wild-type mice on the top. And what we're looking at is the seeping of a blue dye into the brain tissue. All right, so at, by day three, um, you can see infection of wild-type mice. The brain is full of the blue dye because TNF-alpha is making the capillaries permeable. In a toll-like receptor 3 knockout, you infect them with the virus. Again, they survive infection. There are no neurological disease. And you see the dye doesn't get into the brain. Now, I'm not saying that we should take away everyone's TLR3 gene, but perhaps there might be an antagonist that we could develop that would antagonize TNF-alpha at certain points of infection. Better idea would just be to vaccinate people against the virus, I think. But it illustrates the point. Uh, many virus infections make, make rashes that we've talked about before. This is a child with measles, smallpox, uh, varicella zoster, chickenpox, shingles. Those are all rash disease. And these are typically uh, immune-mediated rashes. And what happens is T cells or macrophages uh, home in on infections in the skin. The virus infects skin cells. It's brought there via the blood. And the, the immune cells go in. Uh, they try and clear the infection. They produce cytokines. Uh, you get increased capillary permeability. And that's why some these rashes are red. And an influx of T cells. So it's an interaction of T cells with infected cells that produces the typical uh, rash. Let's turn to some antibody-mediated diseases. And the one that I want to tell you about is dengue fever, or as it's known colloquially, break bone fever, because your bones hurt so much, it feels like they're going to break. This is a flavivirus transmitted by Aedes aegypti, endemic in many parts of the world, the Caribbean, Central and South America, Africa, Southeast Asia, billions and billions of people, well, maybe not billions and billions, billions of people are at risk. And so far, there are about 400 million infect of infections a year, second only to malaria in the number of insect-borne diseases. Now, Aedes aegypti is a mosquito that we almost uh, got rid of in certain parts of the world by using um, DDT. For many years, it was used. It effectively cleared out dengue from South America. There was a big effort to eradicate mosquito with DDT, and there was no dengue before 1981. But you know, uh, we found that DDT harms wildlife, so its use was banned, and fortunately the mosquito came back. You can see dengue returned uh, after 1981, and in places where it was almost gone, it's now back in full force. Um, and the reason uh, for the return of dengue, the mosquito came back, of course. We stopped eliminating them with DDT, and they came back via the tire trade, which I've talked about before. This is a big global enterprise uh, selling used tires, and they're usually transported on container ships in the open air, and they fill with water. Uh, and even if they're in closed containers, they uh, are packed away with water in them where the mosquitoes breed, so they spread all over the world via the tire trade. Right now, the range of dengue is shown on the top map. These dots are all cases of dengue you can see in some places, we don't have Aedes aegypti, like north central US, but there are imported uh, cases as well. So this is uh, quite a problematic disease, and some vaccines have just been developed to deal with it. Now, dengue fever uh, is an infection which can either be asymptomatic or uh, an, an acute febrile illness with headache, back, and limb pain, rash, pains in the bones, as I said. It's usually self-limiting. Um, 
and you recover. But in one in 14,000 infections, you get what's called dengue hemorrhagic fever. And this is where capillaries are breaking. Uh, you're hemorrhaging. You're going to die from shock because you lose a lot of fluid. OK, so that is not a high rate, one in 14,000. Now, you get infected with a strain of dengue. There are four serotypes, but there's no cross protection. So let's say you go to uh, the Caribbean, you get dengue. I had a friend who came back from Puerto Rico, and he was aching all over and joint pain, bone pain. I said, you have dengue. And he, he went to a doctor, and it was confirmed. And so he said, can I go back to Puerto Rico? I said, I wouldn't, for the following reason. If you're then infected with a second serotype, let's say my friend got in infected with dengue type 2, he would make uh, antibodies to dengue 1, memory antibodies, because the, the viruses are similar. But the type 1 antibodies he made would not neutralize dengue virus type 2 infection. Those antibodies would bind to the virus, but they would enhance infectivity. So here's what's happening. Uh, you get infected with a different dengue serotype. You have a memory response from the primary infection. Those antibodies will bind dengue, but they will not neutralize infectivity. And the FC part of the antibodies are taken into macrophages that are not normally infected by dengue virus because they don't have receptors. And the virus kills macrophages. And all sorts of cytokines are released. You have more virus. And the result is you get more hemorrhagic fever and shock syndrome. It goes up to 1 in 90 and 1 in 50 secondary. Remember, 1 in 14,000 of this hemorrhagic fever for primary, now 1 in 50 to 1 in 90. That's because the antibodies are not doing their thing. And so this is antibody-mediated pathology. Another uh, effect of virus uh, infection, which is considered a pathology, of course, is immunosuppression. Many viruses can suppress our immune responses. We have a global reduction in immune responses, and this can happen by replication in cells of the immune system. HIV replicates in CD4 cells. Remember, those are important to make cytokines that help make antibody responses and CTL responses. If you kill the CD4s, you can imagine what's going to happen. Many viruses mess up uh, cytokine production, and some viruses make viroceptors and viral kinds, as I've shown. Here's an example of immunosuppression caused by measles virus infection. Uh, we're actually looking at a tuberculin test. So here's a test, a tine test, where they poke you with a, a little needle with tuberculin antigen on it. And then you get a, uh, a, a, a swelling, which is called induration. And so normally, you know, the, you put the TB into the kid's arm, you get a good swelling. But when they have measles, you see the rash indicates the measles. The T cell response to the TB antigen is completely suppressed. And then after the rash begins to subside, the, T, the uh, TB response returns. So that's immunosuppression uh, during measles virus infection. And that's a big problem. Uh, what happens is measles changes the, um, ability, the, the ability to make the proper kinds of cytokines uh, when antigen-presenting cells are interacting with CD4 cells um, and uh, skews it to something that isn't working well. So normally, uh, IL-12 produced by a dendritic cell, say, and sensed the virus is being sensed. These cells produce IL-12. This would stimulate uh, the production of a Th1 response and production of CTLs, which will kill virus-infected cells. In a measles infection, uh, the virus suppresses the production of IL-12 and favors the production of Th2 cells, which favor uh, antibody production. And that's why that uh, t the TB reaction that I showed you is suppressed, because it's a CD8-mediated uh, reaction. There are a number of viruses that cause immunosuppression. We've talked about measles. Uh, this virus infects a variety of immune cells. Uh, and, and that's how it achieves its immunosuppression. Rubella virus also infects lymphoid cells and causes immunosuppression. And of course, uh, HIV causes uh, infections of T cells, monocytes, and causes a global defect in immunity such that you get lots of secondary opportunistic infection. And then in the end, that's what kills uh, AIDS patients, not the virus itself, but all these other infections that uh, 
are normally controlled by us, but can't be because the immune system uh, is destroyed. That's question for today, which is the following is an example of B-cell mediated immunopathology. Uh, CD8 T cells that cause tissue damage, poxes and rashes, dengue shock syndrome, HIV associated opportunistic infections, or all of the above. All right, what's the answer? Dengue, of course, B cell mediated immunopathology. So uh, CD8, it's not a B cell, of course. Poxes and rashes are T cell mediated rashes and poxes, and uh, all of the above isn't right. I mentioned earlier that there are host determinants of virulence, like MIR-122 that helps hep C replicate. Big, a big area of study now is to identify host genes that determine susceptibility and, and severity of different virus infections. And one very well-known one is a mutation in the, the co-receptor for HIV. This is a, a picture from uh, a long time ago. It's uh, HIV binding to CD4 receptor. And remember, CD4, HIV binds to a second receptor, which is a chemokine receptor. Uh, and one of them is CCR5, chemokine receptor 5. Uh, about 4 to 16% of people of European descent have a mutation in the CCR5 gene that prevents synthesis of the protein. And they're fine. They don't, they don't seem to have anything wrong with them. Uh, they happen to be resistant to HIV infection. So because of this observation a number of years ago, the famous German AIDS patient, the Berlin patient, you, now, you can now find his name online, he needed a bone marrow transplant because uh, he had uh, leukemia. And his doctor, he also had AIDS, so his doctor decided to get a donor for the bone marrow transplant. That was a Delta 32 in CCR5, very smart physician. And so this, this patient got a transplant. So here they ablate your bone marrow, and then they replace it with a donors, and that grows and repopulates your bone marrow. And because and all his immune cells are derived from the bone marrow, they're Delta 32 CCR5, all his HIV had nowhere to replicate, and he's now cured of HIV. And so many people now would like to devise therapies where they take out a patient cell. So an allogeneic bone marrow transplant is a tough one because you have to ablate your bone marrow and give you someone else's. You have to have a match and so forth. But if you can take your own bone marrow out and modify it and put it back, that would be nice. So people are trying to figure out how to uh, take out bone marrow cells, delete the uh, CCR5 gene by zinc fingers or CRISPRs and put them back in. Um, the, the, a, a bone marrow transplant is a very expensive operation though and uh, it's got about 30% mortality associated with it. So it's not a good thing. So people are trying to figure out ways of simply injecting um, modified bone marrow back in without ablating your own one. And that might be a lot safer. Very interesting stuff. A herpes simplex virus, as we'll see in a couple of uh, uh, lectures, uh, mainly infects mucosal surfaces, establishes a latent infection. Periodically, the virus is activated and goes back to the primary site, like your lip or your genital area, and causes blisters. But sometimes the virus goes the wrong way, and it goes into the brain and spinal cord, and it causes lethal encephalitis. And this uh, is pretty rare, but it's very serious. About one in 250,000 uh, herpes simplex positive people every year, and 70% mortality if not treated with antivirals. Not easy to treat because the drugs don't effectively get in the brain. And there are two peaks of incidence of this disease uh, between six months and three years of age when you get the primary herpes infection from your parents uh, or when you are older and the virus is reactivated from latency. So a group at Rockefeller did a study and they said, do these people who get herpes encephalitis have anything different from the rest of the population? So their genomes were sequenced and it turned out that there are uh, uh, SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, uh, identified by genome-wide uh, association studies that say, take these people with serious herpes encephalitis, do they have any mutations that seem to go with it? And they find mutations in uh, genes associated with the innate immune response, TLR3, uh, TRIF and TRAF, which are kinases associated with the pathway, 
and UNC93B, which is a protein involved in uh, putting the TLRs in the right place. So these people have uh, a defect in their TLR3 sensing pathway. They can't sense herpes simplex virus well. And so whenever a reactivation occurs, the virus replicates out of control, gets into the CNS, and causes this lethal disease. So many people now are interested in doing similar studies for other viruses where you have a lethal component. Is there something in the population that we can learn about severity uh, of disease? We may come back to some more examples of that later. Now, uh, there are some other, many other determinants of susceptibility. One of them is age. Very young and very old people tend to have enhanced susceptibility to disease. Uh, young people, especially kids less than a few years of age, they have an immature immune system, so they can't uh, react well. But on the other hand, they don't have as much immunopathology, which is a good thing. Uh, and there's an example of LCM uh, infection of mice where infant mice survive because they don't have a good T-cell response. Remember, it's a CD8 T-cell immunopathology. Older people, they have less elastic alveoli in their lungs, weaker respiratory muscles, a diminished cough reflex. So these are some of the reasons we think uh, they are more susceptible. And here's an example of this strange susceptibility curve for influenza in the US between 1911 and 1915. You can see these are the specific death rates uh, in different age groups. And you can see enhanced death among very young children uh, and among people uh, over 65 or so. So that is another determinant of susceptibility, uh, age. Other determinants, uh, gender is one. Pregnancy predisposes to some more serious uh, disease. Malnutrition is a big one. And in fact, measles infection is far more lethal in countries with extreme uh, malnutrition because of this. It, it, it increases your susceptibility to infection by compromising physical barriers uh, and the immune response. Cigarette smoking increases susceptibility to respiratory infections. People are trying to study this in animal models. We think it is in part because the smoke is destroying the mucosal barrier, interfering with innate immune responses. Air pollution is a, another one. So, you know, we need to keep the EPA around so that we keep air pollution down to lower uh, respiratory infections. And stress. Stress has been shown to increase susceptibility to virus diseases. We don't know the mechanism uh, for most of these, but many people are interested because obviously they control uh, susceptibility to infection.